How thrilled the devastated family of murdered schoolgirl Eliane Andam must be that London's mayor, Sadiq Khan's first priority is not the kids getting killed on the streets, but the clean air they could have breathed if only they were alive. 16 teenagers have been slaughtered in London this year. 13 of them stabbed to death since January, as the scourge of knife crime increasingly turns this massive metropolis into a lethally dangerous place where a child died in a pool of blood on her way to school, cut down by a 17-year-old boy with a machete. To the urgent question, what are you going to do about this ongoing tragedy, Khan's answer seems to be, charge pensioners £12.50 to drive their own cars to the local shops. Then, outrageously, he accuses the Tories of playing politics with a profound problem he's doing nothing to solve. They're not playing politics. He is. Among the many other duties he performs with a conspicuous lack of distinction, Mr Khan is supposed to be London's Commissioner for Police and Crime. Well, he's doing very well on the crime front. It's soaring. But what about the Met Police, the flagship force that has sunk to its lowest ever point in special measures, a cesspit of racism, homophobia and misogyny, numerous rogue coppers facing investigations and charges, especially for domestic abuse and violence, and record low arrest rates. What's the mayor doing about London's lousy rosers? Why isn't he ordering Met Chief Sir Mark Rowley to instigate a zero-tolerance approach to knife possession? Get caught with a machete, a zombie sword, or even a kitchen knife, and you get five years. No ifs, no buts. Proceed directly to jail. Do not pass go. Go to prison. That's called a deterrent a way to persuade youngsters that there's a downside to breaking the law, as opposed to the current dysfunctional system which allows kids to carry deadly weapons without much fear of punishment. But no, apparently Sadiq Khan has more important things to worry about than the slaughter of the innocents. He's got a war to fight. His war. The deranged war on motorists. The mayor insists that his insanely unpopular ULAS expansion scheme, that encouragingly is on course to cost him the next election, is purely to make the air less toxic for health reasons. He's lying. He's charging motorists £12.50 to drive their own cars because he desperately needs the money, because his financially illiterate administration has driven London to the brink of bankruptcy and he needs the people's cash to bail him out. Meanwhile, a heartbroken family mourns the death of a child, a 15-year-old girl who died in her school uniform on a busy South London street in the morning rush hour. If the mayor can't or won't confront this appalling reality, what exactly is he for? Rene, uh, his priorities are in the toilet, aren't they? Totally, totally wrong. I'm not necessarily against a nice bit of clean air in London, uh, but kids dying on the street, knifed to death by other kids, that is a priority. Well, that should be a priority, Kev, but let's face it, as far as Sadiq is concerned, it's not his priority. You know why? Because it's too hard to sort out. Yeah. Much easier for him to, you know, get, get down on the motorists and take their money, because he can do that by cameras and just send them a bill in the, in the post. What I thought when I was listening to your monologue there was quite ironic, really, because soon the only safe place to be will be in a car, and yet he <laughs> hates those cars with a passion. As long as you lock the doors. Well, as long as you lock the doors. <laughs> you know, I really do think that Sadiq is at actually not that interested in black boys and girls dying on the streets of London. Or it doesn't all girls call it and boys. All boys and girls. But we know the statistics say it's mainly black boys and girls in London, not outside of London. And that's where he should be focusing. He should be working with communities, with leaders, with the, the religious um, people in those communities and working out a way to stop this heinous crime that is making our streets a no-go area for children. He yeah. should order Sir Mark Rowley to instigate a policy, as I just said. You tell kids in this city, you get caught with a knife, you get five mm. years. I don't care if you're 16 or 17, five years. That'll stop them carrying knives. Yeah, I agree, but I also think that we should just abolish the Mayor of London as an office completely. I think it's a failed experiment, it's a waste of space, 
Um, you know, we, it's a fairly recent thing as well. I think it was only established by Blair about 20, to well, years in, in the obsessive <laughs> yeah. move to devolution everywhere, which yeah. is a disaster wherever it goes. Yeah, it's completely mad. And I think, look, the Office of Mayor of London has become largely about posturing political campaigns. You know, you remember that big mate thing they put out in um, Piccadilly Circus? Just say to your mate, mate, you know. That's mate! Not, <laughs> there's people being stabbed out there and you're spending millions on this stupid advertising campaign which will achieve nothing. You know, if anything, people just laugh at it. They go, that's a bit ridiculous. Yeah, so the, he spent millions on an advertising campaign to dissuade young yeah. men from, from being, being sexist. So yeah. if uh, any of their friends are sexist, they're supposed to go, mate. Mm. Well, two things about that uh, is that boys will continue to be sexist and none of their mates will go, mate. They'll just laugh. Yeah. That's the real world. Yeah. Don't waste our money on this nonsense. You're right. Devolution in terms of the mayoralship and uh, in other areas, the devolution of Wales, the devolution of Scotland, all these big cities. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit like, well, you go to the people of this country for a general election. You say, vote for the government. Mm. So you vote for the government and then it turns out there are whole swathes of life yeah. that they have no power over whatsoever. Yeah. The fact that the Prime Minister can't really do anything about London Mad. is a scandal. Yeah, it's the capital city. It should absolutely be the remiss of the government to deal with the capital city because it is effectively the advertising board to the rest of the world about what this country is and why, you know, our values, mm. what we produce. You know, it, it shouldn't be left to some political office of some Weasley little man who has absolutely no charm or charisma whatsoever to do his stupid advertising campaigns, go out and bring in ridiculous laws like ULES where you're charging pensioners to drive cars. I mean, come on, we just need to abolish the whole office. But don't you think, don't you think that advertising campaign shows that actually he's like your archetypal goal hanger? <laughs> that he just hangs around the goal, hoping the ball will come and he can just knock it in the back of the net with no effort. Yeah. Because him, back of the net, that'll be the day. <laughs> well, because that'll be telling, the day. He's telling men they're He'll toxic. He'll miss from two yards. <laughs> but he's seen toxicity in, amongst men as saying to their mates, well, hasn't she got yeah. a nice arm? When actually, Mate. what's toxic is our children killing each other on the streets. Absolutely. That's toxic. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Rene, uh, for all politicians, uh, climate change. So he could say, I'm going to make the air clearer in the capital. Yeah, big deal, we won't even notice. But it does but for him to... to say, for him to say, I'm going to stop kids stabbing each yeah. other, we'll notice whether or not that absolutely. works. Yeah. But you know what appeals more to the bleeding heart liberals of London? Mm. I'm going to make your air cleaner. Mm. Because it makes them feel good about themselves. <laughs> now, that they what, can say... what bleeding art liberals yeah. in London? A few people up in Hampstead and Islington. Most people in London could give a damn. Absolutely. They could give a damn about this nonsense, like everyone around the country. Climate change emergency is a middle class privilege. Mm. Simple exactly. as that. You only care about the environment if you can afford it. Yeah, if you've got no other problems to worry about. Yeah. You've got to find one. You've got exactly. To there used to be a joke they'd tax air if they could. Well, they found a way to do it now, <laughs> haven't they? It's time now for for a bad ad. Does the shoulder strap of your car cut into your shoulder? Is your shoulder strap too tight and annoying? Introducing the Tinny Bear, the cute little guy that eliminates all those problems. Designed to make driving more comfortable, the Tinny Bear snaps onto your shoulder strap and moves up and down to remove the pressure wherever you need it. My shoulder strap used to pull so tight I could hardly breathe. Now with the Titty Bear, I really enjoy traveling again. The patent pending design swivels to work from either the driver's side or passenger seat and fits all makes and models. Just snap it on, slide it where it relieves the pressure and drive away. The Titty Bear stays where you want it until you move it. My wife used to always complain about the pressure from her shoulder belt. Not anymore. And the Titty Bear worked so great, he got one for himself too. Oh, those people are insane, aren't yeah. they? Imagine getting yeah. pulled up by a copper as you've got your uh, seatbelt on. Oh, no, but I've got this bear. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? But why is he wearing one? Yeah, exactly. That's well, no, I think spot. it's for all people. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like the purpose, and also, given the name... Yeah, but if I... you think about it, so you, your seatbelt's really tight. Yeah. In, what, in what way does inserting a bear into the belt make it... That'll make it tighter. It does have something nice and soft on your cleavage, though. Let's move on to mean tweets uh, when we examine my always complimentary mailbag as the fans pour in their compliments. Uh, here's one uh, on social media. When did Kevin O'Sullivan turn into a f 
virtue signaller. If he gets any more big-headed, he won't get through the doors at Talk TV. I have just unfollowed him. That'll teach the uh, It won't teach you, because I couldn't give a if you unfollowed me or not. Who are you? Go back to the obscurity for which you were designed. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's have uh, this one that really loves this programme. <laughs> what just happened is an awful fecking show. What sort of is fecking? It's isn't it? An awful fecking show. That's what it says. Stop saying fecking. There's no such word. Uh, you've got some tweets, haven't you, Ben? I've got one which I got you've the got other. got my day. tweet. By the way, that last guy, does he know that he doesn't have to watch the show? Yeah, does he know does what I... a non secretary is? <laughs> yeah, if you know. I don't think it. I don't think so. He, no. Actually, that's not true, but he does have to watch the show. It yeah, is an order quite, on yeah, my part. Absolutely. But no, I got this the other day for someone. Benjamin, is it? Watch what you say. <laughs> I see that Talk TV is how you earn money. Learn to talk and speak with decorum or you'll be sacked. This is, by the way, someone with about four followers who doesn't have that power. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Don't come here talking about loyalty. You're a disgusting person. And go, it goes on, does, but it, it's a generally long nose Does it call you a fecking? Do you know what? There was a, fecking. There was a lack of swearing in that. I, you know, did I expected you cry? more. I did cry. Uh, in fact, I'm still crying. Um, yeah. I've, I have to go for a break in a moment. Well, f off. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go to a break now, a real break, and we'll be back in just a while. <laughs> Mad as hell, it's Kevin O'Sullivan. Welcome back. I am still with my excellent guest, Dr. Rene Hunderkamp and Ben Lochnane, uh, a regular here on Talk TV. Good to have you both on board. Uh, Suella Bravman has been talking about celebrities and their political thoughts, and uh, I thought I might get stuck in as well. Without Hugh Grant's crucial comment, no current affairs debate even gets off the ground. And as for St. Gary, no Lineker, no point. Showbiz stars, don't you just love it when they start telling you what to think? Listen, I wrote Rocket Man, so what I think really matters. Actually, no, Elton. What you think matters no more than the next citizen, who more than likely won't be pontificating from their multi-million pound mansion in the south of France. The privileged view from the Riviera. So, on behalf of the millions of long-suffering Brits who would die a little every time some actor or singer decides to impose their opinions on an unsuspecting nation, here's to Home Secretary Suella Bravman for putting these two-bit jesters into their box. Former football player Lineker likened Tory migrant policies to the Nazis, an asinine comparison that suggests Gaza should stick to the offside rule, Man City's chances of winning the Premiership and VAR, his specialist subjects. Meanwhile, seething in his luxury south of France retreat, Sir Elton haughtily dismisses the Home Secretary's home truth that thousands of lying migrants are gaming the asylum system by pretending to be gay. She's right. But we can't have that. Enter Sir Elt, insisting that Suella is, and I quote, further legitimising hate and violence. Uh, with the shining sun shimmering on the Mediterranean behind him, the OAP pop singer declared that Ms Braverman risked, and I quote again, further legitimising hate and violence. All due respect to the guy behind Benny and the Jets, but what does he know about it? He implies that Suella wants to ban all gays from seeking asylum in Britain. She doesn't. She just wants to ban those who pretend they're gay, those who lie that they're being persecuted by oppressors. Genuine cases are very much welcome to seek a new life in Britain, a new life free of persecution and discrimination, a new life they utterly deserve. Elton called for, and again I quote, more compassion, support and acceptance for those seeking a safer future. But Elt, 
Most of them are telling preposterous porkies. They're nearly all young, they're nearly all male, economic migrants who are skilled at lying through their teeth. But what do you care with your 15 million quid super villa and 450 million pound fortune? Over to the Home Secretary attacking the out of touch pampered elite lecturing the rest of us about very, very serious issues affecting the majority of British people. She continued, Sir Elton is a great songwriter and musician, but I think he's wrong on the migrants. When you go to towns across the country where there are hotels with illegal migrants or asylum seekers, that puts real pressure on communities. My job is to think of them first, ahead of a virtue signaling elitist view from Hollywood Central. Amen to that, Suella for Prime Minister. I mean, we need more of this from our political elite, if I can call it that, don't we, uh, uh, Rene? I mean, to put these people... I mean, who the hell does Sir Elton I John mean... think he is? <clears throat> why, why does he think he's got a platform to tell us what we should think about the migrant crisis that in his pampered retreat in the south of France means nothing to well, him? You've just hit the nail on the head, haven't you? Because the moment they make it from rags to riches or wherever they came from, they completely lose touch with what actually happens on the floor mm. amongst normal lives. And I wonder if we should take all of these virtue signalling idiots and actually let them live on the street for a week with an army veteran who can't get a hotel room, who can't get a doctor's appointment. Come and live with my single mums who live in a multi-occupancy house, sharing a bathroom with their baby and some very nasty drug addicts alongside mm. them. You know, then come and preach to us about what we should be doing as we open the gates ever more. Maybe talk to all the people who worked in hotels that have mm. lost their jobs because the new owners, the new operators of these hotels, uh, they get rid of the staff and hire really cheap people to deal with the cheap migrants. Uh, talk to them. Uh, talk to uh, the people who live around the South Coast mm. who have to endure these invasions of people day in, day out, and so on and so forth. Uh, what it is, I think, with these celebrities, mm. the likes of uh, Gary Lineker, particularly Elton John, pop singers in particular. Elton John, since the age of about 25, no one has ever told him no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one has ever not laughed at his jokes. Yeah. Uh, it's the same for all these superstars. It's not necessarily their thought, fault, but they live in a uh, bubble, a celebrity bubble, where everybody venerates them, everybody worships mm. them, so they come to believe that their opinion is worth more than the next man. Well, it isn't. Well, it's not just celebrities. In fact, either. it's worth less. It's not just celebrities. Either. You get, like, the sort of upper middle class or types who say, oh, that, that lovely couple next door, one of them's from uh, from Singapore and the other one's from India, and he's a doctor <laughs> and she's a she's a sort of a dentist or something. They're lovely. Why are people against immigration? Yeah. It's like, well, go and live in, a, in an area where you actually deal with these, you know, the people who come over yeah. who are, you know, awful for the communities that they're in. They've got this sort of sheltered view of things. And I think someone like Elton John, he's never actually had to experience the sort of life that people actually live in most of the country. As I say to yeah. my friends, so we've got some lovely uh, migrants who've just moved in next door. They're Albanians and yeah. he's a drugs dealer <laughs> and, and so she. <laughs> but they're doing very well. They're making lots of money. Making That's a lot the of good money, thing. Yeah. But the thing is, all of us, we all have friends from every different nationality, Kevin. But what mm. these people don't realise is, and I know because I work in these areas, you just step outside a mile from the centre of London and you go into areas like Whitechapel, yeah. Southall, Ealing, which are ghettos. There are, aren't even streets signs in English, yeah, they're in other languages, they are ghettoised and she's right, in those places multiculturalism doesn't work. Yeah. Well on that bombshell I think we just about uh, wrapped that one up, uh, now it's time for yet another bad ad. I don't suppose you have a copy of Fly Fishing by J.R. Hartley. It, it is rather old. Oh, I'm sorry. It's by J.R. Hartley. No luck, Dad. Never mind. There's still a few more to try. Good old yellow pages. We don't just help with the nasty things in life, like a blocked drain. We're there for the nice things, too. You do? Oh, that's wonderful. Can you keep it for me? My name, oh yes, it's J.R. Hartley. 
the big head he is, you know, phone around. You got my book? Anyone got my book? My obscure book I wrote? Have you got it? I've got it. I mean, why does he want his own book? Hasn't he read it? You'd think he'd have a coffee. Yeah. Somewhere. I mean, you know, I'd love to be in the bookshop, you know. No, legally. Oh, f off, you old git. We've got better things to do than talk to you. But put the phone so down. I'm, I'm going to disagree. I really like that ad. Am I allowed to like that yeah, ad? I like it. I actually it. quite have a soft spot for that advert. Yeah. No. But Mostly because it. you see the old <laughs> the old bookshops in Charing Cross, yeah. as you're saying, you know, it, it feels like a different country. Now you go, it's all candy shops and bake yeah. shops. Yeah, actually, that advert is like from a different country. Yeah. You know, they say the past is a foreign country. Well, I'm, I'm claiming that, asylum there. That is, a, that is a foreign <laughs> country where they still got the yellow pages. Yeah. Like, and there's a claim, family where a yeah, daughter's looking after their dad. to devolve to that, yes. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go there and get our yellow pages. Very, very useful. Well, thanks for your reviews on J.R. Hartley and his yellow pages, but this is a wide-ranging programme and it is, I feel like we need some music for this. <laughs> Sport now. <laughs>